welcome to our panel titled Where Connection Happens. This panel will explore the intersections between the built environment, the physical spaces, and infrastructure we inhabit and interact with, and social connection. From parks and green spaces to community centers and workplaces, every aspect of our surroundings influence our ability to connect. We will dig into policy and design choices that drive loneliness and isolation in our environments, the role of various settings and events in social connection, and emerging innovative placemaking policies, systems, and environments, strategies paving the way for connection. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Philippa Van Hughes, a fellow at the Gore Institute at Johns Hopkins University, where she applies relational thinking and aesthetics of care at the life journal work and democracy building, civic engagement, and repairing the social fabric of our country with one creative action at a time. Joining her are our esteemed panelists, including Autumn Saxon Ross. Vice President for Education and Chief Equity Officer at the National Recreation and Parks Association. Autumn is a connector, actively seeking ways to build bridges between seemingly disparate people, opportunities, and ideas. Next, Graham, Senior Advisor for Innovation Research at the Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation at the Johns Hopkins University. She is an expert on racial and neighborhood equity in urban community development, health, and well being. She works to bridge research and practice to improve public sector innovation. Lastly, we have Aaron Evey, Vice President, HKS Incorporated. Aaron is a world leading architect, researcher, and renowned thought leader on the power of the built environment to foster well being and human connection. She recently co chaired the newly released social framework, uh, Build Environment Report, published by the Foundation for Social Connection. Thank you all today for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. I'm by saying that I am in the best position here. Um, I get to learn from these people. And, you know, I'm not trained in architecture or design. I'm a creative placemaker, artist, I am a curator, and I use a lot of, I, I, I'm sort of a knowledge sponge, and I want to learn from you all and use what I learned here from my own work. And so I want to begin by just telling you kind of what I've been doing um, as, uh, as sort of maybe we could each of us sort of give a little sort of punchy, what are you all working on in terms of fully addressing you know, social connection and loneliness and kind of think of that as a framing for our continued conversation. And then really want to make this a conversation so that we're all learning from each other. And so I want to leave plenty of time, maybe more than 10 minutes, for this kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I, as Secretary you mentioned, I am here as uh, a fellow with the Agora Institute. And the Agora Institute's goal is to strengthen democracy globally. And what's really cool about what they're doing is that they're looking at from many different perspectives. And so I was the arts, and that is maybe a new way to look at how we um, strengthen democracy and improve civic engagement using art and culture as a tool. And I am thinking about it as, um, but yeah, I'm going to keep my phone out and not because I'm checking Facebook because I haven't really tried it. <laughs> I just want to like, do that because I know we're. So I started inviting people over to my house for dinner very instinctually after the 2016 election, people who voted differently. And because I was like very upset with the results, and I was like, I, I need to understand really period. That sort of how it all began. Um, I did work in the arts, but you know, I, I, I did it, I, 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 I'm interested in politics, but I, I'm not a, a scientist or anything like that. I'm just curious, and I was very upset. Um, and so I started inviting people over for dinner around my table. And the long story is those dinners were amazing and just kept growing. And I started to realize I, because I don't work in the arts for a long time, I could use art as a way to make those conversations better, more meaningful, uh, more connecting between people who disagree with each other. And so 
And we're going to skip a lot of steps in between because a lot happened since 2016, <laughs> as you know. Um, but so currently, the big project that I work on is at the University, actually based here in DC, um, but I'm using residents for art and civic engagement at that museum. <laughs> and um, what we're, it, it's part of a, a very much larger reimagining of what a museum space can be. And so we, our museum was really turned into a voter registration community site. So very clear terms with civic life, but my part of the museum will be turned into a relational space, a space where people can gather, have conversations with each other with the idea that the space is the art. Art work cannot become complete until people have a conversation with each other. But you all know that museums, I think that many people believe that art museums are is, and let's be honest, they're kind of lefty, liberal kind of places that have a challenging, provocative art that doesn't make sense. And I don't know. I kind of agree with that a lot of times. And so how do we, how do we you know, reimagine that space so that it is more inviting, so that people actually want to have conversations with each other? Because, you know, gender, you have a passive experience with art. You, you don't actually, you're not even really first talking, but you've actually shushed. <laughs> so this space that I'm creating in the museum is uh, basically looks like a, my my apartment. Um, I've kind of recreated my 2016 apartment where I invited people over, and they, and in this space, um, I convinced the director to allow us to bring food and drink into just my apartment in the museum, and so people will be on to speak as loudly as they want, have drinks. Which you never, really, you know, you know, you never. So, you know, so that, so that's where I'm coming at it from in terms of like how do we create space? How do we design space to have better conversations, have relationships with one another? Because you know, if people have, have a relationship with each other. And so that's my sort of theory of change, my working theory of how I'm approaching the, 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 my building project, which is the museum, the art museum space. And so I am really curious to talk to our panelists. Actually, parts but what parts? And we know that art, beauty, nature, parts are amazing places. There's actual neuroscience research that says that these places are places that are connecting that can help us in. So um, would you mind talking about that? Yeah. Um, and so I work for the National Recreation and Parks Association. And so we are the membership organization for your local park and rec agency. And so we believe in really, um, we're the leading nonprofit that really believes that communities thrive through the power of parks and recreation. So as you talk about civic engagement and, re and relational space, like we are where the people are. That's my favorite thing now, my daughter has been watching. Um, Disney movies a lot more, but we are where the people are. If you think about civil rights movements, if you think about civic engagement, if you think in 2020, where did those things happen? In parks and recreation, some of the greatest uh, performances and speeches given in this country happen in parks. And so for us, we believe we are essential, like so many people started to understand after the pandemic. And so we are social capital. And so it was so much, uh, I saw the work do um, in reading the report on the social framework because we are both design and operation. And so uh, if you, we think about parks and recreation as a small micro you have uh, accounting, you have design, you have landscape, you have architecture, you have programming, you have youth sports, you have uh, senior centers. We operate really at all of the intersections that are necessary for thriving, equitable communities. And that really is the foundation for social. Um, and so it's important that we're excited that we are now being pulled very similar to how we were pulled in this space 20, 30 years ago 
when we had that first Surgeon General's report on obesity. Um, I was coming up in public health in the 90s, uh, which <laughs> was 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> and, and in that, that obesity report uh, for us within Parks and Recreation really galvanized one of our pillars. We have three pillars in, in our PA, equity, uh, conservation, and health and wellness. And when that report came out, we were looked at as that space. Why are we doing health programs somewhere else where there's an infrastructure across the country where the people are, regardless of their age? And so over the past 10 to 30 years, we have been spaces for health and wellness. Um, and so for me, I'm really excited about this opportunity because I see the advisory that was released as our opportunity again to galvanize, but to really um, double down in health and wellness, but for me as the chief equity officer, really find a space for us to see equity as an additional multi-sector solution. If we talk about polarization, polarization and social uh, fragmentation, um, I think we are the place that can really help with those solutions. We are where people sit and passively connect. We are where people have conversations, where young people come and learn um, intergenerationally or with friends. And so that's just a little piece of what we do. And I look forward to um, really helping you all better understand how important parts and recreation is to the social fabric of the people. Aaron, I want to talk a little bit about the design choice that was been I sprung this on Aaron over here at lunch, but I read this article in the Atlantic yesterday. <laughs> Chickens and how like design, like maybe art going to the kitchen space in the front. And like this, it was this part that you were I'm sorry, dining room. Mm -hmm. I meant dining room. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I told you about it. No, get no, no, I'm glad I told you about it. Uh, 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 I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still, no, guys, I'm very sorry. Yeah, um, how the, the, there's like fewer rooms um, because apartments are getting smaller and homes are, you know, the people are making the dining part of the living room. But I, it just got me thinking about like, these are like choices, design choices. That we, that maybe. That affect our connection to one another. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, we gotta ask her. Okay. But we, oh, all right. I have <laughs> not answered the dining room specific yeah. question. Although I think it's, I because because there's actually knowledge behind that, and it'll take us on a giant rabbit trail. But I would have love to go on over drinks sometime or coffee. Um, but I would just say, you know, for me, I. I'm an architect. I work on different types of built environments all across the world. But I think that one of the things that's often missed is like both the process and the product. So a lot of times I, I talk about all design as being social and that that means both the noun and the verb. So the noun being that physical form. So when we talk about dining rooms, that's, you know, a noun. But the verb being, okay, and then how are we creating? Are we co-creating it or is it one person saying, you know, no, we can't have the square footage for that or whatever, whatever. But I do think that, you know, when we want to push the needle in different directions, that's one of the reasons why I'm so committed to talking outside of the design for that, because that's what's important. Everything outside is what becomes our clients, what becomes their constituents, what becomes what is normal. And so if, for instance, you decided, okay, dining rooms are the thing, which apparently this one article has, I would have to check their citations. Okay, let, let me know. But I do think things like front porches, if you look at civic engagement and understanding front porches, you can actually see differences in voter turnout based on the front yard. And so that really starts to think about like, what is this gradient? I think we were talking about this yesterday, around how people create and use their front porches as third places. Um, and for anyone that's not familiar with the third place, it's just essentially that your home is the first place, it's private, an informal 
Second place is typically work, maybe school, you're more, you know, have a persona. But a third place is this messy in between where, you know, it's a liminal space as we talked about today during lunch. It's the space where no one kind of owns it and it allows you to have more of a gathering. And I think that's what the, they're trying to get at with the dining room. It's like, where is it that we are able to connect? And throughout the pandemic, we have so many of our neighbors and our friends over to I'm going to put a pin in this idea of building. spaces. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, context for your connection to connection in the environment. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Graham. I'm with the Bluebird Center for Public Education. Um, I come to this topic uh, both through my work currently with the center. I'm trained as an urbanist and a social scientist and bring both professional and personal passion for the cities. Um, and when I was in my 20s, which was also just 10 years ago, um, <laughs> and I lived in New York City, uh, one of the things I loved about New York City was that it was very walkable and it provided me a lot of sensory input. So I didn't need to be doing much that was programmed, but I could walk through the city and feel very sort of satisfied, just inspired, just sort of feel like I was part of something larger than myself, than part of a okay, community of New York, and feel like a New Yorker. Um, and I really saw that energy from, from the city. And uh, one theorist that I really love, um, Iris Marion Young, she has the whole um, way of laying out cities and difference, and city life and difference, and how it continues in a kind of low stakes way through public spaces like parks and other civic spaces um, and how that can create a sense of excitement and novelty and um, if anyone has um, a neurodivergent or has a child with ADHD or a smart child or you know, novelty and excitement and engagement is pretty important um, uh, to get through the day. And so, so I bring all of that um, kind of personal interest. And then several years ago, I was at a, a different innovation lab then um, here at BCPI working in, in the healthcare space. And we had an opportunity to see some at Ariadne Labs um, at the Harvard School of Public Health. And we partnered with the um, New York City Health Department with the Health Commissioner to um, look at loneliness as a public health crisis. So this year, so it was 2021. So sort of that's the most acute moments of the pandemic, but still very much a part of our, our lives. And so we really tried to, uh, it was a team, there was a, a geriatrician, my doctor, Joe, and others, social scientists like myself. And we really um, worked with the city and with community based providers um, and healthcare providers in particular to really understand like who is the most at risk of loneliness and social. What are their barriers to connection? But then also try to reframe the question as like how so not just treating it like a access to be intervened on, but to really approach the city and city life again. That we really tried to develop a framework um, and some design tools that anybody can be able to use. And so now, you know, I have the privilege of working with cities um, in the U.S. and all around the world. Um, and so we continue to try to innovate on what are those design tools for a topic that with loneliness or other things, but really. Thank you. Well, I, I have so many questions that I want to be off on my own. <laughs> Only from the ones who have been assigned to the past. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask one because I just have to. But you know what? I'm talking about the depolarization, a lot of political depolarization. And a lot of that is based, you know, in part of this world by like how we are living. But the art, is there a way to apply the urbanists and city lovers and that we can stimulate to? The rest of the country, the rest of the country. 
I now live in a small city in Western Massachusetts at the, what someone like, Metro. And I mean, loneliness and social connection is not, you don't have to be in a city or a dense environment to have that. Actually, these cities create isolation and um, Right, this is a, a long now. I really want to start talking for y'all to like get down to <laughs> but like the whole you know, um, one of the most foundational discussions is like, is it is it small town community life or is it city, you know, life of diversity and excitement? Like, what is it that brings us together? Like, what divides us? So, you know, I do think though, from a kind of systems and policy perspective, that we do see a lot of. A, a lot of retreat of uh, systems and services from rural areas. Um, delivery work, you're seeing a lot of uh, labor delivery units, right? So, they just start their families from where they live. So, there's all kinds of changes and service loss, I think, more than anything, the resource loss in some more rural places. Um, in that causes, we're talking about the built environment and people cannot they need by moving out, you know, to their built environment. And that's that can be a really big problem. So that just sort of policy, like what are sort of policies that could address questions like that? Yeah, we because we are we have about sixty five thousand members. We have kind of the posts and everyone in between. And so what we've been finding out in testing, so we believe that like we present innovation and best practices and allow networks. And what we have been finding through this is that it's the same things that people are driven by. People want to be connected. People want to serve their community. The question is that um, of the polarization, it may be stuff of language, or it may be a certain way that we say something. And so for us, it's really giving folks the opportunity to connect and figure out what works for them. So a specific example I have for you. As the chief equity officer, I live in D.C. I can say whatever I want, I can leave whatever. Right, and so through some of our DEI networks, what we've been finding, especially in uh, administration of uh, agencies in states that are anti-trans um, and we believe all children should participate in sports and recreation. Here, stop. And so what we've been finding, and some of we had someone in Indiana that said what she's been using to talk about all gender restrooms is universal design. So here I can say every new place, there needs to be a policy that has uh, gender restrooms, uh, family restrooms, whatever you may say, but she's been using universal design and those principles in Indiana and tying it to the demographic shifts um, with having more uh, boomers in her community. Right, because now with those restrooms, they can have their healthcare workers come and help them get ready for their uh, water aerobics. They can now have, have their children or grandchildren come and help them prepare for whatever activity they have. And so for us, it's really this idea of how do we start conversations or create spaces for people to identify those things that they're working on that are the same and then for me, it's giving our liberal folks permission to be like, I know it hurts for you not to say this word because saying something allows us to be intentional and hit it at the pit, right? And if we are trying to connect and serve, you're going to have to step out of it. And if I have to say universal design when I go home to Missouri to make sure that people can use the bathroom, guess what? I'm going to step back and I'm going to share that with other folks. And so that's some of the specifics that we've been trying to figure out between urban and rural is both creating a space for people 
to figure out those ways that they're, connect, they're connecting for their community and also giving people permission to either, that it's okay if we're not using the word sometimes, mm -hmm. if it is for the greater. I would add to that. I mean, I think I, I love your point because I think that one of the things that we, so we work with cities in, in, in the Americas, in Europe, One of the things is that you have to meet um, not just people, but city governments, right, where they are. And so one of the ways that, that the center is, um, and in work that I've tried to bring home through into some collective work we're doing where, where I live, is you want to understand what people's values are, and you want to find those shared values, but you also need... Um, process strategy, right? You need some operational strategy. And that's where I think there could be some, like how do we how do we operationalize our values? How do we take action? And that's where you might see some variation, right? And they also might call the values somewhat different from one another, but the type of work you're doing, the type of work we're trying to do is to sort of share space and then sort of allow for that, you know, uh, variety. So that's what it means. Yeah, well, I think I actually think Autumn did it beautifully, which is that, you know, if you want to have an inclusive um, park space, right? Like they ought, every, everybody sort of agrees that that these places belong, you know, that, that parks deserve, that everybody gets to use the park, right? That's maybe just like a share value, you know? Now, when you start to push, there's a little bit of like, there's the bias and, and, and right? <laughs> Polarizing. <laughs> but, you know, I think so then, so you sort of think about, okay, what are we all working towards? you know and, and then you start to say okay well the the operational alignment that is i'm not going to be able to get bathrooms that are accessible to all because we offer programming for all if i talk about it as a gender rights issue that would probably be shut down but if i frame it as a disability i mean i love your example because i remember taking my disabled son into a women's locker room and getting sort of chastised because maybe he's too old to be in here and it's sort of like you know, so having these spaces that are about um, disability, universal access. Yeah, and we talk about operational, about operationalizing as what does it look like in action? So you have this value your inclusion. What does that look like when your coworker sends you a spicy email? What does trust look like in your response? Maybe it's picking up the phone and having a so for us, we try and get there through reminding folks of the value, but what does that look like when you're planning? What does that look like when you're creating a program? What does that look like when you're responding to a coworker? Because it's not just about the community that we serve, but it's also the folks that we work with. And so for, for a lot of it is that we start with us as the folks that serve our members and that if we can't operationalize or act value, how can we then help someone else do it when it comes to the design of a recreation center or the design of the program? Take that and put it into, you know, if we're going to do operationalize all the way into now what is the physical infrastructure that becomes that? I think um, I, I'll just share the example of working with Waco Family Medicine in Waco, Texas. They're what's called an FQHC, which essentially means that all of their patients are either uninsured or underinsured. And what I love about it is they're also insanely wildly innovative because their priorities and their payments are aligned, right? With, unlike the rest of us, for the most part, in the healthcare system. And so essentially going and working with them over multiple years, we have, of course, listened to their leadership, their C-suite, all of that, but then listen to the patient family advisory council and understood, okay, what's important to you? We went to where they are. And then ultimately 
went in Spanish and in English um, over the weekend uh, to a community health fair, like large community health fair, all of these different booths. We go out there and create engaging activities where you don't really need to either speak Spanish or English. You could basically just do it being, you know, unable to, to read or speak those languages. But we're engaging and understanding what they want and what they don't. And this is very stressful. It's really hard to come. What like what we'd love to see is somewhere where children can be outside, you know, a little bit of green space to help film you. And going back to their leadership board. We shifted the, you know, it was basically like the site could either allow us to go left or go right, or, and we shifted at 45 degrees. And with that created this, you know, green gym that activates, you know, this corridor for business and allows them to now have programming out there leading up to essentially like a giant front porch with a beautiful overhang. And, and in Texas, it's incredible. And so all of that is not about the architects at all. It is not about, you know, the leadership. It is about what the people want to see and then ultimately how to create a stage that will be there and flexible to serve them over. Space where people feel welcoming and belonging and all the things that we want to feel. What are the things people who aren't yeah, text do to yeah. do that. Like, or, no, or like, you know, like, what are the signals? Or I, I was thinking about Adam Levine, not the singer. Like, it's about <laughs> communicating. Oh, well, how how do you yeah. communicate? This is what I want. You don't do that. Nobody can participate in this. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. There's yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody should watch the social life of small urban spaces. So I really make white. Which is an amazing um, video. You can sure get it from your library. And it's a study of how people use public spaces in New York City. And um, the big takeaway for me that we use a kind of is like movable. There's a lot of other things in there, but people want to be able to customize space in a way that works for them. So, um, which is sort of antithetical to. Uh, space sometimes because you're looking up stuff bolted down and you want to not lose track of it and maybe you don't want someone sleeping on it and there's a variety of, of other decisions that you might be making but that sort of customizable adaptable space um, is one of the big 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 things mm -hmm. no i so, um, please go yeah, yeah i i mean i that's a very big mm -hmm. question i mean part of it's kind of community engagement but i think Part of it too is like things have to be relevant, um, and you have to have folks from those spaces or from from those communities as a part of everything and not an afterthought. Like great places, but quite often people make the places and then they're like, "Oh, what do you want in this playground?" After you've already decided it, so maybe I get a slide or maybe you know the kids in the neighborhood. Um, uh, uh, with a disability. And so for us, a lot of times it's having the patience and the intentionality of just kind of listening and then being able to switch. Like we have a conversation. Um, as a person who always grew up in the city, I have to remind folks it's 40 when I experienced big nature. I didn't get to go to Yosemite until I was 40. Right? Like, and so a lot of times when people hear the outdoor and their nature, that's what they're thinking. That's not me. Big nature for me as a kid in my grandmother's backyard with my cousins doing all types of things we should not have been doing. Right? That was the stepping stone for me. And so when we're creating these spaces or having these conversations, we have to think that, like, for my neighbor who's always on her front porch, that is nature. That is outside. That is recreation. That is social connection. Telling people what it is. Yeah. Right, like we can have a conversation of, oh, I think it's this, and what do you think about this? Because if you've never experienced it, maybe you don't know you love Yosemite, right? Like if you've never experienced, you don't know it. But we also have to be able to listen and incorporate the things that are very important to people, regardless of what you believe. And so it's that it's a it's a very hard dance again between like what we know to help and what are the health benefits and what's going to help with mental health and all these things but also what people are comfortable with and what may be that 
um, stepping stone or that I, I like to call it like the gateway drug. It may be sitting on the porch. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they connect with someone and maybe they're going to walk. And after that, maybe they'll go somewhere else. And so I think we continue to come back to this like dance of having conversation and, and sharing what we know, but also recognizing other people experience and making sure that we're doing that kind of intentionally so that it represents folks. Because we all have places where that are beautiful that no one engages with mm -hmm. because no one thought that you know there are these different people that may be engaged with the same in a different way. One of the things that comes up to add to that is um, who are creating these spaces for. And so um, you have this um, case study that we produced with um, the Down in Memphis, and um, encourage you all to go there if you are find yourself in Memphis, Tennessee, or maybe take a look at the um, the case that we wrote. But one of the things it was a a, a these have changed over the generations of how we value waterfront. We used to think it was industrial and uh, um, lower income households and now it's a sort of vibrant part of, of, of city life is is using um theory and or approach and so Tom Lee Park in Memphis uh just used sort of except for once a year for a festival um the city uh traveled into other cities and had seen all of this um, reactivation of park space were inspired that wanted to do something with Tom Lee. And the thing that really sticks out to me around the way that they did it is that they centered Black life, Black history in the city in the redesign, right? And so it wasn't just a sort of, it wasn't a, it was for all Memphians, but still designed with um, Black history and party of the city uh, at, at the center. And so, and that showed up through programming and design and, and um, sort of naming and partnerships and all of these different things. And so I think, you know, a lot of times in, in, in cities, and a lot of this is revenue generate, like it's a budget necessity, but many big wealth of our sort of flagship spaces are designed for residents and visitors and tourists. Um, they're sort of not exactly you know, uh, maybe our households or kids or what have you. So I think, you know, really trying to balance that, like who is this for is one of the most important questions. Mm -hmm. say, go read the report, please. Um, shout out, uh, co-lead co Risa Wilkerson in the front row. Um, the people with the Foundation for Social Connection are just phenomenal and it's still cross-cutting strategies that touch on everything that they're talking about, um, as well as specific design strategies that sort of do how to do that and provide examples like the Memphis River example to sort of give you something tactical to, to look into to understand you're not alone if you want to do this in your community. Here are other examples of how to do that. I'd be happy to share examples as you know. Yeah, so we so when you ask that question, like that's so I have you know there's there's six evidence based guidelines for design for social connection um, that you know take the place of what we call like an acronym of panache. So sense of place, accessibility, nature, activation, choice, and human scale. So each one of you guys talked about a different part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the you know sense of place is really about you know what is it that's super unique about that so that you know that you're locally here. Mm -hmm. I think this building does some beautiful examples of that. DC is filled with that. Accessibility is all about not only accessibility for you know being able to all all body types, all people, um, not only that they can use it, but that they physically feel welcome there. Nature, you know, as Autumn said, nature is throughout in big and small scales. And what it's about is helping us to feel safe. And when we feel safe, you know, a lot of these things are about helping us feel safe. But when we feel safe, our nervous system 
down regulates and we become more open to being socially connected. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to get into, you know, activation. So what are those? Yes, you can activate any space, but what intrinsically can be activated about the space? Something simple, I just think of like Italian piazzas with the fountain in the center. That's inherently activating. But also people just watching human beings, like, you know? Yeah, people watching, best activation, cheapest, best activation around. Um, and then choice, you know, being able to move your furniture. Bryant Clark. William White, my man, William White. I mean, <laughs> William White was my gateway drug into architecture through environmental psychology. Um, and um, lastly, human scale. So, you know, whenever I think about human scale, um, there's lots of different ways to describe it, but I always think of like prospect and refuge. If you think of being under a tree canopy where you're covered, your back's up against the, you know, um, trunk, you feel safe and secure, but we can look out. That's really like when we can create environments that feel that. And so walking around in DC, seeing different places and the ones that really have lots of people gravitating, watching how many of these sort of check off that NASH checklist that again, all comes from the evidence, um, bless you, from like the peer reviewed literature around how we fund So, <laughs> um, all right, I, I promise to have more than 10 minutes, but for your questions from the audience, I have questions for you too. Why did you, you know, why are you, why did you come here today? Did you want to, are you all building environments? I'm interested because I, because I think the principles that you're all, that we're all talking about apply even to my little small and but it still applies. So it's everything from the water cup yeah. to like the city block. And I like what Congressman Kennedy was saying about like, I haven't thought about how mental health is necessary oh, to use. Yes. I just haven't thought of that as a baseline. Um, anyway, what, 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 so anyway, okay. questions. Um, here. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, um, my name is not. And one of the the reason why we were awarded, taking about fifty students to um, our park, our you know our natural park here um, in Kentucky, and we're also going to have them in the park, but they're also going to be making a um, hip hop and, and you know our track plan, teach and respect about our planning. And just wondering how, um, you know, taking kids from the track, if you know anything about the track, is just making sure that young people get that opportunity to kayak. But also, are some ways that you can think. I'm not a camper, you know, but, but I think that students should have that opportunity to say, I'm not a camper, you know. Um, what are some ways that you think that we could um, um, what could I do with the students? Um, just some advice on what you all think and how to create a space where students are are open to to do this. Yeah, I mean I would I would definitely start with um, you know, the we we talk about both access um and Jay Cole, who's the director of GeoTech and Energy Parks, she talks about the experience gap, and that really gets to belong. And so it's not just enough to have them in the park, but you want to think about experiences that connect them, but also connect them to the space. I mean, hip hop started in the park, literally outside with a microphone and speakers. And so figuring out ways to do that, connecting what your outcomes are to being in that space, but then also um, one thing that I love about this field is that it pushes us to do different things. And so it's comfortable, right? They like rap music. You have them in a place that they know, but like, what is it? Canoeing? Is it capable? Is it something else that, you know, speaks to that space that provides them the opportunity to push themselves? Because as we push young people, or as you just push ourselves, that opens up that creativity and that connection. And so I would suggest 
what's that mix of what they know, what they need to learn, mm -hmm. but also experiences in those spaces that maybe they're not um, exposed to. I took a group of uh, kids from downtown Silver Spring, which is very densely populated, to go canoeing all the way up. Um, and I had, we saw a bald eagle. I spent two hours getting them out of the canoes because this was people fell, um, which if you know, young people, young black people are not excited to fall into, you know, and no one likes falling out of the canoe. And it was the most amazing experience uh, for me to see that joy of just never having done anything before. So I would suggest just what, what's something that pushes them into doing uh, something they haven't done because you're going to see the difference in what they write and how they Again, adding this sort of relational aspect to, to everything is Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Sam Van Bleed. Uh, I'm a public policy intern with the Gerontological Society of America. I'm also a partner with Miami University's Institute for Learning and Retirement. Uh, I hosted a course called how, uh, like how to Make a Movie. It was for older adults. You know what an ILR is? It's a, a program where older adults can take classes. I had a movie, basically a class on how to make a film. And my older students made a film about social isolation and loneliness. They chose the topic, they put it together, they went and did doc style interview of it. Um, AARP just picked it up. And the thing was, is they were, Oxford, Ohio is a very small town and they wanted to gear their film towards what they felt were the lonely older adults in cities. So you guys talk about the ideas and like, oh, you're in a city, like you've got all these people and it's walkable. But a lot of people who live in this town moved to this town because they wanted to get connected to people. And um, a particular person in the film had said, I lived in California in a densely you know, packed apartment building. I didn't know my neighbors. I know every single person everywhere. And a big attribution of that film was the role of third places. You can go to local mom and pop cafes and you feel like you're not going to get kicked out, right? If you sit there for three hours, only buying a cup of coffee. And so I was just curious if you guys had mentioned third places and the role of these things. And we'll talk about this from an aging perspective. How do we promote third places for older adults, but also intergenerational spaces where people of all different, you know, walks of life can come together to, to communicate and to not feel the pressure to go back to our silos? So first, I just, one, wonderful, wonderful question. Love it. Love your work. Two, I want to encourage you to get involved. We're creating um supplemental reports from ours. And one of them that focuses on rural environments specifically, and it, really looking forward to it. I would love to like just pull on that um, there. And there are some amazing researchers that focus specifically on third places um, and older adults. I do think, you know, having the, that intergenerational is huge. And one of the things that we cite in our work, I think from Generations United is sort of this idea that let's say 92, something like 92% of people want and think that that would, that these intergenerational spaces would help to support, you know, social connection. Something like 24% actually are aware of any of them. And so both finding those, supporting them, and then, and then allowing that to, um, and then like promoting that I'm seeing more of, so there's an ongoing conversation that I've been having with um, Stephen and, and others from uh, Massachusetts around essentially looking at senior centers as they used to be known and how fewer and fewer seniors want to go to senior centers and how the, you know, the role of the YMCA and how intergenerational that is and how to take an asset-based asset approach. So essentially an approach that says, what's already working and how we build on that. And so I think that those types of things are are like seeds or I guess they're already blooming, but how can we, you know, help propagate that rather than create it? But I, I'd gladly talk more and would love to get you plugged in. I know there's lots more questions, but we only have two minutes left. Strict about time. <laughs> they, they said we can have a few more minutes. We do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay.
Yes, so I work for the National United. Like, oh, I I work. <laughs> <laughs> they really want to live with a different generation and still be involved in their community. Struggling to see is like being part of a part built for older generations to live there. They're very spirits heavy and they're just they're just not accessible for people in these places. And it's just um just wondering if there's any like advice or any designs that could be intentional when it comes to in those spaces that are more accessible for multiple generations to live there instead of just the younger generation or like that middle age because or they're really expensive if they are yeah, really yeah. there's not a lot but like that middle part get There's, uh, so our, our whole like housing market needs to be like right size, not just for older adults, but for um, <laughs> single people and multi-generational, like we have such a massive sort of mismatch between what stock we have and what our residential environment uh, thing and, and houses in, in the U.S. now. Um, and I think even to the the point um, about the the video in the small town versus the city. I mean, what comes to mind for, for me in these examples of older adults and, and other populations is people want to be able to move safely, right? Like it was sort of like mobility is such an important um, being ambulatory in some way is such an um, aspect for for aging um, in a community and for maintaining connection. So whether it's whether it's stairs or um, you need a car, you know, there are all these different ways that people end up um, kind of in retreat. I think one of the things that we have seen um, some success with, I've, I've been working on um, research in Los Angeles around ADUs, accessory dwelling units um, for older adults. Um, it's a very small pilot that the city launched several years ago, and it subsidizes the ADUs for housing and care older adults. And um, and the thing about it is actually that they're they've already been built. So homeowners already have them and are looking for a tenant. So it's the city really does a matchmaking and service uh, provision process. But one of the things that they were hearing in designing the program is that people sort of warmed to the idea of having an older adult um, in uh, on their property, right? You know, a lot of these are attached. Some are, some are recent. But in general, it was sort of this idea of like, maybe I'm an older homeowner, and so I, I could have a peer who sort of lives nearby. Maybe I have young children, and this person can be a mentor. You know, so that was sort of one, um, and that has actually resulted, right? So that's that's one option, and I think that when you hear housing. Uh, one, I, one thing I would love for you all to do is to go back to all of your communities and advocate for sort of this kind of missing middle housing or light touch density housing and to sort of think about like, where are those spaces that we can design for older people to age in our community or young people who are gonna be living on their own for longer? You know, so that's, a, that's one that we've really, we've seen some success with. Um, but, but it's not just like, let's make sure people can get a loan to build an ADU and then do, you know, people want, they have usually someone in mind for who they want to live there, but there can be a little bit more of a strategic effort to kind of program them for certain populations. So, how about this other the room? So, brief answer. Okay. <laughs> um, my name's Andrea. started um, Starbucks and was part of the team at RDI called the um, about the knowing that every decided by somebody who's on something um and the the design that's the panache design yeah thanks. I'm just curious if, uh, let's say that everyone building something out there in the world is like 100 people, 
is like one person applying principles. Like I'm, I'm curious about the penetration of like is everyone using those design principles for those spaces that they built, or is it just like one? Is it is it in its infancy? In its letting age zone? Let's you know take take, take some let's take some drops and like you know, um would be my response if it, if I keep it short. <laughs> so, it's, so it's just it's in so yeah. So I have a podcast called Shared Space, which actually features a woman named June Grant. Uh, talking specifically about ADUs in LA and the fabulous work from ARP. Um, but really it is, yeah, it's, it's just this infancy and I would love to collaborate. With well, I know. Yes. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>